If you're a newer poker player just getting into prefop strategy, you might be a little overwhelmed with all the things you need to learn and know. So I wanted to break this down into seven easy tips that can help you play better prefop poker. Let's get into it. Good morning, how are we doing today? My name is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit. I'm a poker player, poker coach, and also author, and today I wanna to talk to you about preflop play, so that way you can start making better decisions preflop, and also, just in general, make your life easier and more profitable. So let's get started. Tip number one is simple, never open limp. Seriously, if you're open limping at all, if that's at all a part of your poker strategy right this moment, just stop immediately. And just to be clear, I'm not saying don't limp at all preflop. I'm saying do not open limp at all preflop. So if you're newer to this terminology, an open limp is when you are the first person to be able to enter a pot, and instead of deciding to raise or fold, you decide to limp there or just call the big blind instead. Now this tip, just like pretty much all the tips in this video, are very focused on new players. If you've been playing for a while, studying for a while, you know that there are some situations where open limping can make sense, especially from the small blind. However, we're not going to talk about that in this video. This is very focused on newer players who really need to just make their prefop strategy work. And open limping in general is not going to accomplish very many goals. Our overall goal preflop is to either pick up the pot uncontested or put ourselves in a situation that's going to be more profitable and typically that's going to be a situation where hopefully we can get either heads up post flop or just pick up the pot uncontested preflop. That's totally fine too. Open limping doesn't accomplish any of those things. You put yourself in a spot where you could face a raise and with a hand that you're probably not super stoked about facing that raise and why not just raise yourself if it's a hand that you deem worth playing. So overall strip open limping totally from your pre prefop strategy, it's going to make your life much easier and also just generally prefop and postfop will become much more profitable as well. So you know we just talked about not open limping ourselves? Well, raising bigger over limps is one of the ways that we can attack players that continue to make this exact same mistake. So take a situation where EP2 open limps and it folds around to you in the cutoff with a hand that you want to raise with. A lot of players are going to choose a size that's roughly around the size of their open raise, or maybe they open raise plus one extra big blind, but normally it's not quite big enough here. So simply because this is a situation where think about what a bigger raise might accomplish. Either the person who open limped, who is likely doing so with a pretty marginal range, decides to call, in which case they put in more money when you have things like position, you have a playable hand, and all of a sudden you have all these nice edges in your favor, now you have initiative, that's great too, or you raise to a larger size, you give the blinds less incentive and a worse price, same thing with the open limper themselves, and they decide to fold. Well, picking up two and a half big blinds uncontested is not an absolutely terrible outcome by any stretch of the imagination, especially if you can raise here with wider and wider ranges, use more and more hands, and again, attack and abuse the effect that your opponents are simply open limping and then folding too often. And you can do this exact same thing when there are multiple limpers. Let's just say EP2 open limps and the hijack limps behind folds around to you in the cutoff and you have a hand that you again deem valuable and playable. This is a spot where I would definitely suggest raising something larger. And a lot of players are gonna raise here to something like four or five big blinds, which is okay, fine, bigger than their open raise size, but I would still heavily consider going even bigger. Maybe something like seven or eight big blinds. I've even gone as big as 10 or 12 big blinds in certain situations too. Just really depends on how I think those players are going to react and exactly what I'm trying to accomplish in this exact situation. As a typical general rule, I would use something like five big blinds plus one big blind for every limper that's involved here. So in this spot, that'd be five big blinds plus there are two limpers. So seven big blinds would be the total isolation raise size. That would be pretty normal sizing. And again, much bigger than what a lot of players, especially players that are newer to the game are actually using in spots like this. Tip number three is to simply call less often preflop. And you'll notice once again this constant focus on getting rid of a lot of that preflop passivity. And this isn't just preflop calling in terms of limping or limping behind. This is also talking about things like calling when you face a three bet or calling when you face a four bet. A lot of players will simply call here way too often because they have a hand and they're like, hey, this is playable, but they really just shunt all of those playable hands into their calling or passive range. And then some of their monster hands they decide to play fast, but more often than not, there's going to be a lot of calling. This is very, very common amongst new players. And this applies pretty much everywhere preflop, whether it's a situation where there's an open limper or multiple limpers in front of you. Look for spots where you can isolate and play those hands aggressively, especially with hands that a lot of players will just limp behind with every single time, things like King Jack offsuit or Queen 10 suited. These are hands that can oftentimes fare better if you play them aggressively rather than always limping them behind. Same thing if you raise and face a three bet, look for situations where you could consider coming over the top instead of just always flouting that with something like ace queen or pocket tens. And same thing if you're facing a raise and you're like, eh, 
am probably just gonna flat this with 9-8 suited. Well, what would the benefits of 3-betting be instead? Playing it more aggressively, could you get your opponent to fold a tremendous amount of better hands rather than always just saying, hey, I have a playable hand and thus I'm gonna call. Again, that strategy is pretty much what most new players are doing, but not necessarily what's going to be absolute best for you, especially in the long run. Tip number four is very related to everything we've been talking about so far, and that is to play your big hands aggressively and fast. Eliminate the slow playing from your game. So most players inherently understand this, and they play their big hands, their aces, their kings, etc. pretty aggressively pre-flop, three betting it, four betting it, doing all that kind of fun stuff, which is all well and good. But there are definitely some players that look at these hands and are like, eh, I'm going to slow play in this situation. I'm just going to flat it instead of three betting it. I'm just going to open limp this because it's going to be trickier. I'm just going to limp this behind because it'll be trickier. If you constantly find yourself saying, I'm going to do something because it's tricky or it's slow play, chances are you're just tricking yourself more often than your opponents. I'm not saying you're never right, but oftentimes players take this way too far and make a lot of preflop blunders because of it. So unless you have an incredibly good reason that you can articulate extremely well, do not slow play preflop. Just play your big hands, your queens, your kings, your aces, your ace king, all that stuff. Play it aggressively preflop and go forward from there. Honestly, for most players, and especially in these smaller games, it's going to make a lot more money to just play them aggressively rather than trying to get tricky and get slow play. It's just typically not going to work out better than taking the more aggressive alternative action. The next tip is to remember that position is everything. So to make sure we're all on the same page with jargon and definitions, being in position post-flop means that you are the person who's going to act last, and being out of position means that you simply do not act last, since if it's a multi-way pot, you could be out of position if you're the first person to act, or also the second person to act. So that's the way that we're going to talk and define in position versus out of position. And just in general, being in position makes a lot more money post-flop, since when we are in position, we get to see what our opponents do. Do they check to us? Do they decide to bet? If they do decide to bet, for what size? How do I think they are liking the board or not so much liking the board? Being in position makes life a tremendous amount easier, gives you more optionality, and that, at the end of the day, is going to be a very good and profitable thing. So the actionable takeaways from things like this would be to play fewer hands from early position, since your probability of being out of position if you go post-flop is much, much higher. Play more hands when you are near the button or on the button, since you know you're going to be in position for sure, or probably going to be in position if you end up going post-flop. Again, when you're in like the cutoff or the hijack, you're likely going to be in position post-flop, but it's not guaranteed as if you were on the button. And then from the blinds, you also want to be very selective since your probability of being out of position if you end up going post-flop is very high or guaranteed if you're in the small blind. And it might seem a little bit weird that we're talking a lot about position as it relates to post-flop when we're thinking about pre-flop tips. However, it's really important to understand that what you do pre-flop is going to impact if you go post-flop at all, and if so, how are you likely going to go post-flop, and are those good or bad things for you? So in general, if you're going to likely be out of position, you want to have the initiative in that situation, since if you're just simply both out of position and also don't have initiative, meaning you're the one who's constantly being passive, that's typically going to be a situation that's not going to pan out super well for you. Again, you're occasionally end up getting lucked out by it, but it's really important to understand that at the end of the day, that's typically not going to be a money printing situation for you by any stretch of the imagination. Now, before we go any further, I want you to really understand that we are just starting to scratch the surface of real preflop strategy. And if you want to go deeper on a lot of the things we've already talked about, as well as tons more, I would highly suggest checking out Core from Red Chip Poker if you haven't already. Core is the most complete A to Z poker course that's ever existed. The overall goal is to give you a complete syllabus so you learn everything you needed to learn to build a strategic foundation from preflop to postflop to mental game and everything in between. There are different courses, both for tournament players and also live cash game players. There are tons of stuff in terms of actual hand history examples, and everything you need is right there. Very easy to follow, great structure, and only $5 a week. Check out redshippoker.com slash core to get started. Again, redshippoker.com slash core. This will take you a lot further and a lot faster than if you try to study everything piecemeal through YouTube videos or other things. I assure you, you're going to enjoy it and get a ton from it. Again, redshippoker.com slash core to get started today. Tip number six is to understand that most small stakes players are actually risk averse. Now, this might seem like an odd statement since most smaller games are going to have a higher density of fishy players. However, there are still plenty of nittier players in these games, and most of them are going to melt away if you apply any real pressure to them preflop. And by the same token, not all fish are created equal either. There are plenty that will feel if their stack is at risk that they're just likely going to roll over a lot of the time and really only continue with premium hands. And the thing is, is that there simply are not that many premium hands available preflop. So whether you're in a situation 
situation where you think your opponent's going to look at premiums as really just being something like queens plus or just something like tens plus ace king or something like that it's still a situation where you can definitely do a little bit of off table work and explore how often they are likely to fold if you do decide to apply pressure so that way the next time you're in a situation you're more able to say hey this is probably a good three betting spot or a good four betting spot or maybe a spot where i can go larger because they're going to fold more of those kind of marginal premium hands in which case why not use the larger size attack them and really really print and now you might be starting to see how everything's tying together nicely thinking about our previous tips we're talking about calling less being less passive prefop raising over limpers if we're going to do so using larger sizes this is one of the ways that everything can start tying together and really creating a prefop strategy that works and honestly picks up a lot of uncontested pots prefop even pots that you might not necessarily be entitled to in a normal situation if your opponents are simply playing a little bit too risk averse folding too often and you can easily take advantage of that with a little bit of extra aggression in your overall prefop strategy and the final tip is to make sure that you know your prefop ranges really well so if nothing else you definitely want to know your open raising ranges again we already talked about getting rid of open limping from our strategy altogether so if it folds around to you you are going to be open raising or folding from here on forward and if that's the case these are the hands you want to have memorized and the best way to do that honestly is just to download the gto ranges app do a little bit of studying and off table training the whole goal is to memorize these do not pull these up in real time but if you work with these honestly just review them for like five minutes a day for a week or so they're going to get memorized pretty darn quickly if you are a live cash game player or a six max player definitely focus on the exploitative ranges they are a little bit simpler easier no mixing included if you want to go for the gto ranges you're more than welcome to but i would highly suggest for most players sticking to the exploitative stuff especially if you're a cash game player focus on those and it's going to make your life much much easier and again even if you're a full ring player you're talking about memorizing like nine ranges it's not going to take very much brain power to memorize these a little bit of practice a little bit of time but it will sink in i promise you and then once you have your open raising ranges memorized i would highly suggest moving over to your three betting ranges and really understanding these and getting these memorized as best as possible now of course there's going to be a lot more in terms of number of ranges of three bet ranges to consider since if under the gun opens and you're next to act there's a three betting range for that if under the gun opens the next person folds and you're the next person well there's a three betting range for that etc but a lot of these ranges are going to be very very similar whether you're using exploitative or the gto ranges within the app so just kind of work through these a little bit maybe start memorizing a little bit about what you should be three betting against an under the gun player when you're say in middle position when you're in late position and when you're from the blinds and do that same exact thing for a bunch of different situations and over time it's going to get memorized and internalized very very quickly again the exploitative ranges are going to be a little bit tighter a little bit more straightforward no mixing included and if you're a cash game player again stick to those at first it's going to be much much easier and for what it's worth all of the exploitative ranges are included with your core price if you do decide to enroll so keep that in mind there's really not much higher value for just five bucks a week again redshippoker.com slash core to dive in enroll and get all of these exploitative ranges too so those are the major tips that i would suggest for a new player really working on their prefop strategy and it really boils down to getting rid of a lot of the passivity in your prefop game adding more aggression getting into spots where hey if you're facing a raise instead of just automatically calling because you have a playable hand highly consider taking the more aggressive action focus on position thinking a step ahead in terms of okay if i end up going post flop am i likely to be in position or out of position and is that good or bad for me and my hand type and the overall goals that i have in this situation and making sure that you have some of your prefop ranges memorized especially your open raising ranges but if you can get your three bet ranges memorized as well that's going to be incredibly incredibly helpful again most players are nowhere close to having any of this information they're just simply kind of clicking buttons and just playing by feel and if you can have a little bit of this stuff kind of offloaded and just memorized it's going to help you a tremendous amount in real time and that is going to wrap it up for this one if you enjoyed please give this video a thumbs up and especially give it a thumbs up if you want to see a follow-up video for this for newer players focusing on post flop tips as well i might get into that video in the near future let me know if it's something you want to see again as always thank you so much for hanging out if you need anything at all please don't hesitate to let me know otherwise as always good luck out there and happy grinding